Just before I introduce our first uh, speaker to join me up here, I want to briefly tell you a little bit about uh, a trip that Rob in the back, Josh over here and I went on recently with the World Federation of Hemophilia to Senegal in West Africa. One of my major takeaways uh, came when we traveled outside of the, the capital city of Dakar to this city about 60 kilometers outside called Tiez. And when we arrived at the only chapter outside of that main city of Dakar in Senegal, uh, there was a chapter meeting, much like this, where community members got together to share stories and in large part introduce themselves to the World Federation and the other visitors who are a part of this trip. And their stories were very, very challenging. A lot of hardship, a lot of young death, uh, again, coming back to that lack of access to factor. But something that became uh, very, very clear was that aside from the access to factor, which is clearly the most, the, the biggest challenge that the developing world faces in our community, the lack of education and communication is, seems to be the second most challenge, at least in Senegal. We met one man in particular who struck me named Mathieu who was there with his two-year-old son who had been diagnosed only a few months prior with hemophilia. And Matthew shared his story of how since his son was diagnosed, he as a pig farmer had to sell 80% of his pigs in order to pay for the care that he was able to get his son. Uh, as he put it very eloquently, when you get diagnosed with hemophilia, your wallet get di gets diagnosed with hemophilia as well. And Matthew had said, in Senegal, we don't talk about our problems. We don't talk about our challenges. It's accepted that everyone has them, and you don't burden others by sharing yours. And he pointed out in that very room was his cousin with her two boys who had hemophilia. They have a family history of hemophilia, but even within his family, they didn't share that knowledge. They didn't communicate about that because it would be seen as burdensome. Had they communicated about that, perhaps they would have diagnosed his young son sooner, and perhaps he would have survived at least a little longer. And that message was very clear, the lack of community, the lack of communication. How long have you been a board member here? Uh, two or three thousand years, I'm pretty sure. Two or three thousand. <laughs> How old are you again? Uh, I am 27. Okay. Uh, I've been here with the BDA for about three years now. So, and you are here because you are in grad school, correct? Yes, yeah, I originally was born and raised in Minnesota, uh, did my early schooling in Minnesota and Iowa, and then I came out here for grad school. Uh, and you were very active in Minnesota as well, is that right? Yeah, uh, Minnesota, uh, there's one chapter for the entire state of Minnesota. I was a very active community member there. I went to summer camps year after year. I was actually a counselor for the summer camp one year. Uh, I see there's a lot of, uh, many have left, but there's a lot of kids here, so I'm assuming there's a lot of families who are relatively new to the community within the last five or six years who are maybe thinking about uh, camp. Do you have any uh, camp stories that kind of summarize what the camp experience was like for you from the camper perspective? Uh, let's see. I have a lot of stories. Uh, the thing I remember most about camp was uh, the, the camp that I went to in, in Minnesota had these these camp-wide activities and one of them was a site-wide capture the flag game where they took the entire sprawling uh, camp and campus, split it right down the middle, took all of the counselors and all the staff and all the kids. It was so liberating because this is an entire camp do, devoted to children with hemophilia and bleeding disorders. It's an entire camp of kids who have been constantly told no. And here they are telling us yes. And I don't think it's because the game was very fun. I mean, everyone loves running around. <laughs> but. But the, th the part that was most impressive was just that we got to have that freedom to just go play. Yeah. We got to, for a couple weeks every summer, go be kids instead of being hemophiliacs. And that was a huge uh, weight off of a young pair of shoulders. And, and growing up as well, you had, if, if uh, my memory serves me, you have a, f a family history of hemophilia, so is that correct? My mother was a carrier, but she was the first person in the family who had any, any connection to hemophilia, so it wasn't even known that there was a, a family tradition of hemophilia, you know, that there was any hemophilia in the family until I was born and I started uh, showing symptoms. Uh, How early so, were you diagnosed? Uh, very young, uh, 18, 24 months, somewhere in there. And, and she tells the story that 
even then, even you know, it would have been what about 25 years ago now. Uh, the doctor came in and told her this, and he told her it like a death sentence. He told it to her like it was this this dramatic pronouncement. Um, That's terrifying. Yeah, she she remember. I remember her telling me <laughs> that the doctors had given me a life expectancy of around 30. And she said, your, your child isn't likely to live terribly long. He's likely to have a lot of pain in his life. And this is like 1990, if I'm doing the math yeah, right. You're about yeah, two years old. Yeah, so right right before um, the first recombinant and the first uh, factory developed factors started hitting the market, it was right around this time where there were there was just a, this feeling in the community that the that it was a still a, just a crippling, debilitating illness. And to grow up and go to a camp like that, to go to to, to be able to look around and see people who are managing their disease, and to um, get to just enjoy life and not have to worry about that, not have to feel like that's a problem or a, a thing that 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 I'm going to end up, you know, that that's how I'm going to, that's how my life is going to go. It was, it's just incredibly freeing. I had an inhibitor until I was 13. My quality of life before 13 was very shaky. Mm -hmm. um, I've lost my brother. So I, I feel as, I feel like the work that I do is compelled because I went through a lot and I feel as though I, I understand that and I want to try to help that if, if for others. But you had a very interesting perspective on why you feel inclined to serve and get involved. Would you mind sharing what your inspiration is? Well, it's almost the opposite. I've, I got so lucky. I got into this incredible community that was um, able to support my family, able to, to give us the information that we needed, to give us the assistance we needed, to give us the opportunities like that. Uh, and so when I, when I came out here, I thought that this would be an excellent opportunity to, to give that back that I'd, I had benefited so much from the community that why not help the next generation benefit from the community just as much? Um, why, not, why not help other people have access to that kind of opportunity that I was able to have and that helped me so much with what could have been such a traumatic uh, disorder but instead has just become a natural sort of part of my identity that because I didn't have problems, I wanted to make sure other people didn't have those problems either. Right. And whatever I could do to, to help volunteer, um, I, I wanted to do that. From Minnesota to being here, uh, what, were, what are some of the similarities in, in terms of the community and the needs and maybe some of the challenges? And I'm just curious to know from your perspective, what have you seen as some of the similarities and differences between the community in Minnesota and the community here in New York? Yeah, you know, I've gone to some of the national meetings. I've, I've met people from around the world with hemophilia, and I find that the hemophilia community is incredibly uh, consistent from place to place. Uh, that that we all struggle with a lot of the same issues. We struggle with a lot of the same uh, problems and, and challenges and obstacles, uh, and that. The, the people who work at, at what's now my level, I guess, in the, on the boards and volunteering for the communities, that we all share information. We find what works in one state and we share it with people who are having that issue in another state. Uh, honestly, the biggest surprise to me coming out here and the thing that I've had to adapt to most um, is the incredible Von Willebrands population here. Uh, in Minnesota, I knew that Von Willebrands existed and I read a book once where somebody was having a nosebleed and that's all I knew about Von Willebrands. And to come out There's here, more to it than that? It, it turns out, yeah, there actually, there seems to be more to it than that. The other half of this is that now that I am on this side of the community, now that I'm working for the community instead of part of, instead of being a, a sort of community member, um, getting to see what goes on behind the scenes. Uh, like Laura mentioned that next week we have a planning meeting to talk about the, the kinds of um, legislative challenges that we're having, the types of access challenges we're having, and the, uh, the, the way that we as a community can try to address that and try to get our message out to the people who are supposed to be representing us, to the, the legislators and the lawmakers. It's really interesting to see the planning side of it and to see the, the power that, that the individual families have. I was one of those families in Minnesota, and now I can see why those families are so important. That legislation and legislators talk to people who know policy and people who talk about policy all the time. But the power of a single family with a single uh, a child with a bleeding disorder who comes in with their vial of factor and says, this costs me thousands of dollars every week. It's just an incredible statement, and it's such a, it's such a different um, uh, such a different narrative and a different power that we can't have 
just as, as policy people, that you need families and you need communities to be involved in that. So I think you've, you've just kind of said it, the most important thing from an advocacy perspective that someone can do, or I shouldn't say the most important, but one of the most important is to participate in things like Albany Days on the regional level or on the state level and Washington Days on the federal level to speak directly to uh, legislators about what our experience is and, and what our needs are. What is something that someone could do who maybe can't participate uh, during Albany Days or Washington Days? The most important part of what we do with advocacy is address issues in the community. And so if, if we don't hear about those issues and if, we don't, if those don't get raised with us, we can't best uh, work to be advocates. So the most important thing that people in our community can do is keep us informed. They can keep in touch with us, they can let us know when they're having issues with anything related to hemophilia. If, if there's an issue with the type of insurance that you've got, if there's an issue with access to care, if you're having trouble with anything, letting us know that, not just for advocacy, but for, the, for our, our board and, and our, um, our chapter as a whole, being, uh, being useful is what we're here for. Being able to help you and assist you and get, get uh, any care or any assistance that is needed out there, that's our job. Because any issue that one person is having, at least another dozen families are having. And that, that one family that's brave enough to, to stand up and let us know is the family that's gonna affect the change in the community. So switching gears now, uh, again, a lot of families are here. You have a sister, and we were talking uh, earlier this week about how growing up, there was uh, an interesting dynamic when it came to being a part of the hemophilia community from, or the bleeding disorders community from the sibling perspective. Can you share a little bit about that dynamic between you and your sister growing up and kind of where that turn took place? Sure, I'm a little worried though because this is going to end up on YouTube and I just know she's going to find it and call me up you know, someday. But, uh, I'm going to email it to her directly actually. Oh, we were talking about that, yeah. <laughs> uh, most of the time that I was really active in the hemophilia community was in this, this time where she and I didn't exactly see eye to eye on all things. She didn't necessarily feel like it was inclusive for her a lot of the time. So it was, it was difficult. It definitely put a, a bit of a strain on our sibling relationship. Is, is there anything that you could share with parents here, strategies that maybe they could apply in the, ho in a, in the household if that is something that comes up? Uh, in a, it's, it's funny to say that being diagnosed as a carrier is a blessing in some way, but it, in, in terms of what we've discussed, that dynamic, actually having a diagnosis that made her more directly a part of the community is something that you said helped. But if that's not the case, what are some things that parents can do to try to help curb that friction among siblings? I don't want to, not being a parent myself, I certainly don't want to you know, make, make prescriptions or anything. Um, that a lot of the programming we saw was directed at the hemophiliacs. And when it wasn't directed at the hemophiliacs, it was directed at the parents. But there wasn't really much discussion about families at all. So taking a little bit of time to talk to talk to, you know, talk as a family, talk about the, the way that the hemophilia affects even the children that don't have it. Is that something that you guys on the board talk about, the, the siblings, is, is specifically siblings and how to account for them in programming? It's, it's something that we're always trying to do is find these populations of people that don't, that don't get the kind of recognition or the kind of programming that maybe they need. Right. And so we're always looking for that. We're always looking for, for ways to highlight those groups with our programming and make all of the disparate parts of this community feel welcome and feel like they're supported. So speaking of that, so I was chatting a little bit earlier with, uh, with Dave, whose wife, was Debbie, was a part of that meeting. And one of, the, one of the things that came up, which I have to, you know, a little bit embarrassing, but full disclosure, I'd never really thought about, was that young woman who's dating and what happens if she's a carrier and after a couple dates, if it's getting serious, there's a point at which you might want to share that genetically there's a chance if this goes the way we hope it does that we should be prepared for, and that's a scary thing. And I know for me when I was dating, I was very aware when it, at a certain point, not at first because I'm very open about having hemophilia and I always have been, but at a certain point, I did start to feel as though this is actually impacting these interactions. You know, have you found that at all in terms of dating or in friendships or in any of your personal relationships? Has, has the role of being a person with hemophilia impacted the way in which you interact with people? 
I think it has, but for me, it's been mostly positive. Um, like like you said, I've always been somebody who's been very open and upfront about this. I, I always wear my medic alert bracelet. I always um, inform people in, in appropriate situations if they need to know. All of my friends know. They all call me bleeder. They all, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're very they aware. They even have the lingo down. Yeah. Wow. Uh, when, I was, when I was younger in, in elementary school, I played soccer. Uh, and my team knew because I, I had to tell my coach that you know if I got hit in the head with a soccer ball, this is a bigger deal than if any of the other kids did. Right. Um, and and my team sort of some of them were some of them scoffed. Some of them were teenage boys, you know, like like teenage boys would be. Um, but others were were actually kind of supportive, and they would want to make sure that I did my shots before the games and that I took care of myself before games to make sure that I was able to play and participate. Um, as, as far as dating life goes, um, I know that it's always been something I've been upfront about. Um, there, it's it's a it's an important consideration because I do want to have children someday. I do want to, you know, raise a family, and that's something that I'm going to have to clearly have to be very upfront about and have to to acknowledge. But I, I'm always kind of shocked that the, the just the change in my lifetime means that the idea of going into things and having a kid with hemophilia or having somebody who'd be a carrier, that's not. A scary proposition to me anymore. Not like, not like it was when when I was born. Right. You know? And so it's, it's a thing that's worth considering. It. It's something that I'm definitely very upfront about. But it's not this, it's not this shame or it's not this uh, this uh, uh, hidden information, or and it's not a it's not a fear that it could have been before. Uh, now it seems like the worry is much more about how to manage it and how best to control it and, and deal with it rather than how to even live with it. So t tell us a little bit about what you've experienced with Lorenzo when it comes to going to the ERs and trying to advocate for yourself. I found that I am educating the providers and um, the majority of them are not receptive to what my husband and I are telling them and um, want to run a gamut of testing when I'm holding a little bottle factor that said, all you need to do is mix this and, and do an IV and put it in and he's going to be good to go and you can have us out in and out in 10 minutes. And it's no, you really, he could have a fractured foot or this or that and it's no, no, that's not it. Could you please call the hematologist on call? And so that in itself has been a pretty big challenge that, you know, the HTC isn't always open and when you go to the emergency rooms, um, some providers, you have to learn how to keep that firm voice and really say, hey, you're going to listen to what I have to say. So Lorenzo is uh, diagnosed as severe, is that correct, or moderate? Oh, no, we were talking about yeah. this. It's been... I would say moderate. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and as of now, he's treating on demand, so correct. there's not factor in the home. Right. Um, is that something that you are considering because of these experiences? Because one of the things, as you were saying earlier, uh, Jeff, about kind of some of the universal truths within this community, it seems as though people having problems at emergency rooms is just a reality of our community because they, they don't know because we are a very small population. So have, have you considered ha keeping some factor in the home and getting a prescription in the home so that when he has these bleeds you don't have to go through that? Um, we have talked about it. So we do have the factor in our home and we bring it to the hospital, but um, we would like to get to the point where, you know, we're infusing Lorenzo and we avoid the whole ER trip. But he's to the point where he'll sit, he'll watch the infusion. He's pretty uh, good about letting us um, get to him and give him the infusion, so. Share with us a little bit about your family history with hemophilia, what you knew to expect when you found out you were pregnant with a boy, if anything. Give us a little bit of backstory. So I was told that I could or could not be a carrier. Um, and when I was pregnant, I was told, no, you're 100% a carrier. So that was a news flash. But, um, we really didn't know too much. I knew my dad had it. Um, I've never seen my dad give himself an infusion. Um, and he just kind of carried on with his business. Um, he was just generally kind of quiet about yep, it. Yeah, very quiet about it. And that's kind of where we took the approach with Lorenzo. 
um, you know, we're going to remove this stigma and he can be proud of who he is. And yes, he does have hemophilia, but that doesn't mean he needs to be debilitated by it or not proud of who he is. When, when you met your, your now husband and you knew you could or could not be a carrier, was there any, was that at all a part of your consciousness at that time? It was. I brought it up. Um, you know, after we were dating and started getting serious, I said, you know, I could have, I could be a carrier of hemophilia. And it was like, oh, okay, sure, whatever. Like, who knows what that means? Um, took it in stride. Yeah. <laughs> so then we decided to um, get married, and then you know, I ended up getting pregnant, and. Um, we were like, okay, so we should probably get some more information about this. He was 100% supportive about it, and I think it was just talking to people, finding out what it meant, and going from there to see what we were actually going to have to be dealing with. And, and once uh, Lorenzo was born and diagnosed, how quickly were you involved with the community and, and learning from other new parents and, and other folks in the community? What, when did that start? Um, I would really have to say it was probably after the first year. Uh, the first year was kind of like that paranoid mom of, oh my God, is there something going on? Is this more than just him coughing on something? Or, right, right. Um, but afterwards, and dealing with it, and really letting it sink, sink in, because it actually took a while for that to happen. At what point did it start to sink in? I'm curious. Honestly? <laughs> yeah, why not, huh? You know, I would say it was a good six months before I actually really started to accept it. Um, and then now it's like, okay, this is part of our routine. Was but there a bleed a at six months, or was there something that happened at six months, or was it just um, time? It was just time. I mean, he had his first set of, or second set of shots. Um, he had an immunization. It ended up causing a bleed, so he had a, a large hematoma on his thigh, and it was actually the first time that we actually had to deal with anything. So um, that was reality check number one. Um, and then along the way, a few things would happen, and I would keep getting that reality check. I mean, Lorenzo is, in, he's a pretty good case of, um, best case scenario of hemophilia. So. We're very fortunate of that. Um, so every now and then we're reminded, oh, here we go. <laughs> Loss of control, which I am not good with whatsoever. Right, right. Um, and that's where you know I started getting involved. Like, OK, I can't change this. But what I can do is get involved in the community. Specifically, what role did the community play when you first started getting involved to helping you feel a little bit more grounded, letting it sink in, et cetera? I think, honestly, it was our friends and family. It was the HTC staff who were 100% supportive. Um, we're just starting to connect with families at this point with um, bleeding disorders for Lorenzo to interact with. So it's still, we're still on that learning curve, but um, it's that our friends and family are um, supportive of the diagnosis and don't treat him different than any other kid. So. I was and Laura, where is she? She was been She's like got, my number one to go to. So. It, it's so important. I mean, and I find that to be so true too. When when doing these events and just getting to visit chapters, the the chapter leadership has a monumental impact on the life of the community members. Because as you said, the HTC staff is is great. They they serve certain needs, right. but there are other many other needs that need to be served, and it, it really right. does fall to the chapter leadership. And you know that includes both of you as well, and, and that's to your credit. You had mentioned, and I was uh, happy to hear how early you started talking to Lorenzo about his his pokes or sticks or pokes, pokes yep, um, and talking to him at a comprehension level that he mm -hmm. could understand. And um, what was that conversation like? Because I can imagine that's a that's one of those moments that you come to as a parent when your child has anything that makes them quote unquote different than whatever the norm is, how did you kind of tackle bringing that to Lorenzo's awareness and at such a young age? Um, so it became education day one. When he was born, started with a bracelet. When he could start to talk, um, you know, explaining that he had blood that was different than others, um, that he needed medicine when he got a boo-boo and would fall. Um, we would talk about the process of getting the medicine and dealing with it and, you know, taking that bubble and instead of it making it so small, making it big. So he learned how to control his own body and talking about we could do this and this could be a result of whatever action he's taking. 
um, and describing it in terms that he understands. So we'll say, Lorenz, at this point, now that he's going to be four, we'll say, okay, we're going to get an infusion. But earlier than that, we'd say, we're going to get a poke. And we're not, because, and we want to change to, yeah, it's uncomfortable for a minute, but you don't want to make this a huge fearful process of where they're going to regret it instantly and there's a cause and effect of I'm going to get this infusion and it's going to make me feel better. Right. So communicating that, you know, reading books, talking about what it is um, and how we treat it um, and just telling him he's just like, you know, you know, any other kid. Some kids need medicine for some things. This is what he needs medicine for. So making him proud of who he is. And, and for a parent who might say, well, for, for me, I, my child is going to have an, enough adversity in his life. I am taking care of it right now. He can't do it himself anyway. Right. He can't understand enough anyway at this point. I don't want him to feel different. Uh, so I, I don't want to address it until he's older. Mm -hmm. what, what would you respond to that hypothetical parent? Just based on keeping Lorenzo, Lorenzo informed of the plan, making him a part of the plan, having him make decisions, he's gaining a little bit of that control and knowledge to be able to say, when the doctor's giving me a hard time in the ER, he'll say, I just need my poke. <laughs> and he'll stick up for me. <laughs> so. Um, I think it just presents itself that he'll teach other kids, you know, this is why I wear a bracelet. And it gives them that little bit of control and understanding that when they're harder, when they're older, you know, they might become a little more resentful towards it. Right. So, and he's willing, he walks in, he'll sit for his arm for the infusion and hold it out for staff to get, you know, to where they need to do. And I just think it makes the treatment process a little bit easier. We've known each other for a very long time. Yeah, for uh, yeah, very long time. Yeah. Since Can you guys hear Chris 14, okay? 15, 16. That's better. Like that. Is yeah. it better? Hello? I'd say even longer than that, than that because we met at Double yeah, H did, yeah. forever ago as campers, then as counselors, mm -hmm. and now we're just two dudes living in the world together. Just hanging out, you're yeah. having a good time. So we talked about it with Jeff a little bit. Um, can you talk a little bit, and actually specifically since you and I, we went to a camp where it wasn't just kids with hemophilia. When we mm -hmm. were campers, yeah, right, it was kids that had, I mean the number one population served, I, I remember uh, one time in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was hemophilia, HIV, sickle cell anemia, and then I think after that cerebral palsy. What, what did that, being in such a medically diverse community, and you know, something that Michael knows about too from Double H, what did, what did that do for you as a, as a person with hemophilia at such a young age? Well, you know, I, I came in, you know, thinking I have this, I have this disease, this ailment, and it, you know, it's kind of a, uh, it's a tough thing to go through as a child, I think. Um, and you know, you guys were talking about Lorenzo a second ago, and I kind of had flashbacks with my, my childhood, and my, my parents treated it the same way, and it was, it's very empowering, I think. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing that you're doing. Um, Just starting the dialogue so yeah, young. Yeah, absolutely, starting it so young. And so yeah, going into Double H, um, I got to see a, a vast array of illnesses and problems, and some of them are, are quite severe. Um, but some of these kids who, are, who have these, these, these strong problems, these strong illnesses, are the, the happiest, go luckiest people you've ever seen in your entire life. And it kind of, it gave me this, this thought that, hey, you know, things aren't as bad as I think they are. You know, there's no, there's no need to be upset. There's no need to be sad. You know, just, just live life and enjoy it. And I imagine you still see that because you work at Albany Med. And mm -hmm. what, what is your title there again? Uh, I'm a patient care associate. And you've been doing that for how many years? Uh, seven years. So you've what? seen, I, I imagine, a lot there as well. Absolutely. Did the experience of going to, not just having hemophilia, but then also going to, to camp and, and seeing all of these different ailments that the randomness of genetics could give any one of us, did that influence your decision to work, work in healthcare? Oh, absolutely. Um, when I was working at, at Double H, um, I, I kind of geared myself towards the, the kids who needed more help. I kind of just naturally went that way. And then when I left Double H, I went and worked with uh, children still as uh, uh, um, for at-risk children who are like court mandated to be with us. And then I went working at Albany Med. And that was like my first time actually working with, with sick adults. And I got to incorporate, I, I got to see like a full spectrum, I think. Um, and, and my time, the thing is, I was, I was very open about my illness when I was younger. Um, at Double H, I, I became very open because everyone is there. And uh, even at, at, when I worked at LaSalle School, 
I was very open about it too. But when I hit Albany Med, I, I decided to not talk about it so much, to kind of withdraw myself a little bit um, over the years. And then and it turned into a thing where it was just kind of in the background. And it was just kind of, it was there, but I'd, I'd forget about it. And, you know, I, I'd allow myself to forget about it. Then kind of denial took in a little bit, I think. And uh, you know, I think the power of the mind is, is infamous. It's, it's amazing. And um, one way or the other. And without even realizing it, I became uh, uh, very withdrawn and, uh, about my, my problems. And because of that, I, I haven't really kept up on my infusions. My, so I'd say like I'm supposed to infuse three times a week. I'm really doing it maybe once a week at best, uh, maybe a little bit less. And, uh, and you've noticed the difference in terms of your health with, with that oh, change? Absolutely. Um, I mean, not, not a vast difference. But you know, I find myself limping here and there. I might wake up one morning and be like, hmm, I, I feel a little sore. I, when was the last time I infused? Uh, oh, like 10 days ago. Maybe I should uh, do that, you know? So, you know, that type of thing. So I, I so appreciate how honest you are because this would be, I, I, I'm sure there are people, I mean, you got, you got Papa sitting right Papa here, sitting I'm right sure there. going like, mom's, uh, mom's not here, is that, she? No. no, she's in no, the next she's room. In the she's going to hear about this. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, yeah, yeah you, got, you got poor Lorenzo's mom. I, I'm sure there are him people. One day. So, but let's go, back, let's go back. Why do you think it was that when you got to Albany and got to Albany Med and became a, a professional, what, what caused it to kind of fade into the back? Look, yeah, you got, you got poor, You're so, making me stressed. What <laughs> Lorenzo's mom thinking that's going to be him one day. So, but let's go back, let's go back. Why do you think it was that when you got to Albany and got to Albany Med and became a, a professional, what, what caused it to kind of, look, yeah, you got, you got poor, You're so, making me stressed. What <laughs> Lorenzo's mom thinking that's going to be him one day. So, but let's go back, let's go back. Why do you think it was that when you got to Albany, and got to Albany Med and became a, a professional. What what caused it to kind of look? Yeah, you got you got. Poor, you're so, making me stressed. And that's totally fair. That's yes. totally legitimate. One day. So, but let's go back. Let's go back. Why do you think it was that when you got to Albany, and got to Albany, what what caused it to Albany Med and became a, a professional? Yeah, look, yeah, you got you got. Poor, and that's totally fair. Right. That's yes. totally legitimate. Yes. But one day. So, but let's go back. Let's go back. Why do you think? Right. But, but as you had mentioned, even all the waking up and all those little bleeds, or as my former hematologist used to call them, those micro That's bleeds, totally right? fair. they're causing irreversible damage. You're extremely intelligent. You know, you know all this. What do you think? And also, making me no, you're very intelligent. And your emotional intelligence is even greater because you're sharing very honestly in front of a, a group of people. What, what do you think it is that, what, what's that switch? What, what do you think is preventing you from saying, all right, I'm going to stick to my three times a week. I'm going to log to make sure I do it. I want to enhance my quality of life. What, what, what do you think, if you had to put a, put a, a pin on it, is, is that hold? Saying, all right, I'm going to stick to <laughs> my three times a week. I'm going to log to make sure I do it. I want to enhance my quality of life. What, what, what do you think, if you had to put a, put a, a pin on it, is uh, well, you know, saying, all right, I'm going to stick to my three times a week. I'm going to lock. You have to talk to them about it. Like to make can, sure you can be infusing in your bedroom and not change no, your social right. interactions, right? What do you think if you had to put a. Uh, well, you know. My three times a week, I'm going to lock. necessarily have to talk to them about it. Like you can, you can not change your social accountability, right? But like I said, what do you think if you had to put a. Uh, well, you know my three times a week I'm gonna lock them about it like True. you can all right so I'll make you a deal ability starting tomorrow I'll be your hemophilia accountability bud uh, and we'll we're gonna give each other our regimens because I could I travel all the time and sometimes I'm like I'll do it in the morning and it's fine but you know what I shouldn't let's you and I be text buddies tomorrow. and let's hold each other accountable we'll try it till the end of the year and if it seems to be going well maybe we'll carry it into the next year Not necessarily is that deal I'm in some all right deal here, here we go we're accountability buddies now so go, going forward in your in your work, what do you what do you see as your long term? We were talking a little bit about kind of what you're think. You know, we're at basically the same age, and at that point where you start wondering, am I going to continue down this path, or do I want to try something else, or at what point am I too old to try a new field? What, where are you thinking about in terms of the next steps for you professionally? What you're think. You know, where what do you see as your long term? Going to continue down this path? Point where you start wondering, am I else, or at what point am I death, or do I want to try something? Else? Too old to try a new field. What, where are you thinking about in terms? 
well, professionally. Uh, what you're thinking, you know, where, what do you see as your long term going to continue down this path? Point where you start wondering, am I else, or at what point am I death, or do I want to try something too old to try a new field? What, where are you thinking about in terms of well, professionally? Well, you just, you, you had mentioned, you recently just, uh, same position, but you're now working with a different population, right? You're going to continue down this path, else, or at what point am I death, or do I want to try something too old to try a new field? Oh, you're transfer you, you haven't transferred yet. But you just, you, you had mentioned, and, and you're going from what to what? What? I shouldn't. Let's you and population, right? Yeah. I'm going to continue down this path, else, or at what point am I death, or do I want to try something different? Oh, you're transfer well, and see how you feel in, in, in that one. area. And, and you're going from... And in terms of uh, how do you feel, and we talked, I guess we kind of already broached this in a way, but in terms of your personal life, how do you feel as though at this stage, has, it, has hemophilia taken such a back seat that it's not really, I mean, I guess you could say it is impacting it, but in a kind of covert way. And from what to what? Um, we talked, I guess we kind of already broached this personal life. How do you feel in a way, but in terms of your, has, it, has hemophilia taken such a feel as though at this stage, such a back seat that it's not really, I mean, I guess you could say it is in overt way. Yeah, absolutely. Impacting it, but in a kind of co talk to, I guess we kind of already broached this. From what to what? Um, in a way, but in terms of your, has, it, has hemophilia taken such a feel as though at this stage, such a back seat that it's not really overt way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess you could say it is in talk to, I guess we kind of already broached this. Impacting it, but in a kind of co in a way, but in terms of your, yeah. has, it, has hemophilia taken such a feel as though at this stage, personal life, how do you feel overt way? Yeah, absolutely. Such a back seat that it's not really talked. I guess we kind of already broached the. I mean, I guess you could say it isn't in a way, but in terms of your packing it, but in a kind of co feel as though at this stage, has it has hemophilia taken such overt way? Yeah, absolutely. Personal life. How do you feel? talk? To, I guess we kind of already broached such a back seat that it's not really in a way, but in terms of your plea, I mean, I guess you could say it isn't feel as though at this stage, impacting it, but in a kind of covert way. Yeah, absolutely. Has it has hemophilia taken such talk? To, I guess we kind of already broached the personal life. How do you feel in a way, but in terms of your such a back seat that it's not really feel as though at this stage, really, I mean, I guess you could say it is in overt way. Yeah, absolutely. Impacting it, but in a kind of co talk to, I guess we kind of already broached this. Has, it, has hemophilia taken such personal life? How do you feel in a way, but in terms of your feel as though at this stage, such a back seat that it's not really, I mean, I guess you could say it is in overt way. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Um, and you talk to, I guess we kind of already broached this. Impacting it, but in a kind of co personal life. How do you feel? Has, has hemophilia taken such a feel as though at this stage, in a way, but in terms of your plea, I mean, I guess you could say it is in overt way. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Um, and you talked, I guess we kind of already broached this. Impacting it, but in a kind of co personal life. How do you feel? Has, has hemophilia taken such a feel as though at this stage, in a way, but in terms of your plea, I mean, I guess you could say it is in overt way. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Um, and you talked, I guess we kind of already broached this. Impacting it, but in a kind of co personal life. How do you feel? Has, has hemophilia taken such a feel as though at this stage, in a way, but in terms of your plea, I mean, I guess you could say it is in overt way. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And, um, and you talked. I guess we kind of. Has it been challenging working with people who who are at a have a diagnosis or a, where they're they're reaching end stage of life? Has that been something that has affected you maybe more so than you could have anticipated? Oh, yeah. And, um, and you. Has it been challenging working with people who who are at a have a diagnosis or a, where they're they're reaching and seeing that has affected you maybe more stage of life? Has that been something? Um, at times, yes. Oh, yeah. And, um, and you working with people who has it been challenging a diagnosis or a, who are at a having that has affected you maybe more where they're they're reaching and um, at times, yes. Stage of life has that been something working with people who? Oh, yeah. And, um, and you. Has it been challenging? A diagnosis or a thing that has affected you, maybe more, who are... Is there a, is, was there a particular story or moment with someone that they shared? Because, you know, having spent a little bit of time as well with folks who are reaching the end of, of their time, um, the, the willingness to share often seems like it's much higher, especially if they are in the company of an empathetic person. I'm, I'm curious, have you received stories from people? Any stories that have really stuck that you could share with us? Um, the, the willingness to share often seems like it's much higher. Uh, next month. And, and you're going company of an empathetic. Oh, okay. Especially secret story. Yeah. Receives. All right, fair enough. I'll respect you. Don't know about it. You know, but I you know that you could share with us. Um, the the one seems like it's much higher. Willingness to share often company of an empathetic person. Share them though. Oh, okay. Receive stories from people. And but, but you know, like I said, I, th I feel like don't know about it. You know, but I you know. don't. But you're now working with a different. Um, the the that you could share with us.
Willingness to share often seems like it's much higher. Share them though. Oh, okay. Company of an empathetic person. Yeah, but, you know, like I said, I feel... yeah. All right, fair enough. I'll respect you, but you're now working with a different. Uh, right. Especially if they are in the willingness to share often that you could share with us. Share them though. Oh, okay. It seems like it's much higher. Company of an empathetic person. You think that you can't. Yeah. All right, fair enough. I'll respect you. Right. And if you think. Um, the, the willingness to share often, especially if they are in the company. Share them though. Oh, okay. It seems like it's much higher company of an empathetic person. You think that you can't. Yeah. All right, fair enough. I'll respect you. So I just have one question left. The same question for each of you. So actually, let's pass the mic down to Jeff. We'll start with him. Um, I'm just curious to know, between this annual meeting now and annual meeting next year, is there one goal that you have with regard to the community or one thing that you'd like to see change, one thing you'd like to accomplish? Give me a focus from your perspective of something you'd like to see us make progress on between now and next year's annual meeting. An annual meeting next year, regard to the community or yourself as a person with hemophilia. Something you'd like to accomplish and seems like it's much higher. Give me a focus from your perspective of something. Oh, a lot of honesty coming up up here. No, All right, I like progress it. On. Uh, you want to get in on this little accountability the thing community or one thing on? annual meeting, meeting next one thing you'd like to accomplish and seems like it's much higher the infusion game as well perspective of something you'd like to see it now in next year's annual meeting yeah, all right yeah. i like it uh, you want to get in on this little accountability an annual meeting next year one thing you'd like to accomplish and seems like it's much higher the infusion game as well perspective of something you'd like to see it now in next year's annual meeting yeah, all right yeah. i like it uh, you want to get in on this little accountability an annual meeting next year, something you'd like to accomplish and seems like it's much higher. The infusion game as well. Perspective of something you'd like to see now in next year's annual meeting. Yeah, all right, yeah. I like it. Uh, you want to get in on this little accountability? Fantastic, fantastic. But for you, Christina? I would say our family goal would be to start infusing Lorenzo at home. We're getting to that point where we're more comfortable and we're ready to accept another challenge. Uh, it's a great goal. Community, I'm focused on our walk. May 21st, 2016. That's where I'm at. Mark your calendars. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. And, and what about for you, Chris? What's one goal for yourself and then for the community? Let's do one and one. Community, May 21st. Sounds like we did. Yeah, I think we did. You, you started on the group. Mark so. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and what about for you, Chris? What's one goal for yourself and one, it looks well, like? I, I think we just. Community, May 21st. You started a little group. <laughs> Thank you very much. Where I'm at, Mark so. your calendar and one, it looks well, like. I, I think we just... Community, May 21st. You started a little group. <laughs> and I feel like, the, you know, I'm. <laughs> Where I'm at, Mark so. your calendar and one, it looks well, like. I, I think we just. Real quick, round of applause for this really great conversation. To watch video from any of our previous Powering Through sessions, visit poweringthrough.org or to learn more about National Cornerstone Healthcare Services, NCHS, visit nchswecare.com.